Hello. A warm welcome to this second to last session of Build 2019. Have you had a good build? Good. Looking forward to the party tonight? Good. So my name is Johan Lindfors. Uh, I work as a computer consultant, uh, currently focused on building games. The last five years, I've had the great fortune and the happy situation in helping a company called King. So I've been a part of a team uh, for the five, last almost five years building a lot of cool games on the Windows platform. If you don't know what King is and uh, who they are, uh, they are one of the most famous casual, uh, mobile casual game company in the world. They have a couple of franchises that are kind of familiar, maybe even more familiar than the King brand. They have Candy Crush, naturally. Uh, they have Pet Rescue, Farm Heroes, and the Bubble Wish Saga brand, the franchises. Uh, they actually have more than 200 titles available that you can play all over the world. It's uh, both on the mobile and on the web, and on different platforms, naturally. And they're also hugely successful when it comes to reaching. I have a good, uh, a strong fan base. Like this first quarter of 2019, they had more than 270 million monthly active users. That's a huge fan base, a lot of people playing the games. And I actually um, met a couple of people this, uh, during lunch, and they asked what I'm going to present about, and I talked about like, Candy Crush. And they said, so are you going to tell us how to get rid of the start menu icon or the start menu tile on Windows 10? I'm not going to do that because it's supposed to be there. Uh, being pre-installed is a very good thing, actually. Uh, but also, uh, King was acquired by Activision Blizzard for a couple of years ago as well, so they are a new, uh, part of a huge uh, gaming uh, community and gaming company. So during these five years, uh, we have done a couple of games for the Windows 10 platform. Uh, we have also not just release the games, we do uh, usually like try to do bi-weekly updates, bi-weekly meaning uh, every other week, not twice a week, but uh, every other week we do updates of these games. Um, and also naturally maintain the games, new features, uh, test stuff on Windows, try to make uh, cool implementations, leveraging the Windows ecosystem and the Windows technologies. Uh, and we also learned a lot of the stuff, how to write games naturally, but also how to actually take leverage of the platform that Microsoft provides for the universal Windows platform. What's interesting is that the games that we have built for Windows 10, they are pure U UWP application and games. So uh, I'm gonna talk about this, uh, this as well, and I'm gonna show you a huge amount of code, I think, actually. I'm not gonna write that much, but I'm gonna show you a lot of code. Um, it's almost all of it's C++, so I hope that's fine. I also was told that I should probably put that in the session title because people have uh, lost, uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of C++ content uh, at, at build, so let's, let's keep that up, I think. So we have a couple of lessons that we've learned, and some of these lessons you will find are really common sense. It's like there's no big secrets in this, 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 these things, but still I'm gonna demonstrate some of the topics within these lessons also, trying to get you educated in how we build games and how we build game engines and such, but also what you can take with you when, you've done, when you do universal Windows platform applications or like actually development in common. So the first lesson that is kind of important for us is that successful engines, and I can also say framework when it comes to apps, they aren't really built, they should be refactored meaning that putting people to, uh, in, in a situation where they're supposed to build the next version of the framework or the engine that our company is gonna use when we build applications, that is bound for failure. Because you don't want to take the best people that you have in building this framework because they also want to keep maintaining the games and such. Instead, it's much better to build an application or a game than refactor what is really success successful from that application into something that is reusable for other applications to use, and then try to build a, sort of like a, uh, an engine based on that. The engine that we have worked primarily with is a native, it's, a, it's actually a proprietary engine, it's an in-house engine that has been developed by King. It's called Fiction Factory. And this is a native C++ engine uh, with, with a kind of, kind of cool focuses that I'm also gonna demonstrate and show. And, and it's, it's targeted towards several platforms. Uh, meaning that it should also be easy to add additional platforms 
from, uh, from, the, from the architecture and from the design of the engine. So for us to inject or create the UWP um, version of the engine, it shouldn't be too hard. And it, it wasn't that hard, actually. And I'm, I'm going to talk about this as well. And we currently support like Android, iOS, UWP, Win32, pure desktop Windows, Mac OS, uh, Linux, HTML5, AIM scripts, and such. And it's a native C++ engine, and it leverages very specific platform implementations by, uh, for Android, it's actually using Java uh, for the platform-specific calls into Android, and JNI for communication back and forth between C++ and Java, and Objective-C for iOS and for the uh, Win32 desktop version of uh, application and games using pl uh, plain vanilla C++. And when we started building this engine for, actually, we started with Windows Phone 8.1, and then we went all the way up, up to the stack that we have today. We actually decided immediately that we want to go for a native implementation, not going with the C Sharp.net version or C Sharp UVP version. Instead, we went for C slash CX, but have lately migrated pretty much all of the code that is existing in the engine to C slash WinRT instead. I'm going to talk a bit about that as well, uh, the experiences there. What also uh, uh, was interesting for us when we started the project was that this is an engine using OpenGL ES. Uh, calls for the 2D and 3D rendering. And that is something that could be a hurdle, and uh, I'm going to explain how we solve that as well uh, by using third-party uh, tools. So the overall structure of this engine is actually that we have some uh, initiatives that we want to make sure that it, it should be easy to create new games, that when we set up a new game team, it should be easy to set up the game, leverage the knowledge and the skills and the technologies that is available from the engine and all of the earlier uh, games such and such. But there should also be naturally unique code for the game, not just code. A game usually also consists of a lot of resources like assets, like textures and uh, atlases, models, meshes, uh, animations, uh, shaders and such. So these, these two buckets, that is pretty much the thing that is unique for the game. So what comes the engine from then instead? Well, the engine is sort of like uh, outside the scope, and we have considered this like to be two buckets, actually. We have internal dependencies, which is actually the engine that we've built themselves, ourselves, the, the packages and systems within Fiction Factory, and then we have third-party packages as well, or third-party dependencies. I'm going to talk about those as well. And the engine then is partitioned and separated from each other in like uh, reusable components. You can call them packages, you can call them systems, um, or just buckets or whatever. And, and these are like suggestions on how you can partition an application. You can have a rendering pipeline, you can have like a file system package that handles all the IO, um, not trying to be dependent on other packages and such, trying to be very, very um, focused on specific purposes. We have texture management, like uh, storing uh, textures and atlases. Uh, we have input handling the application for bootstrapping the application, making sure the games, making sure that it's efficient, have a strong and high performance game loop that is both battery efficient and uh, resource efficient, but also very high performance. Uh, handling threads and such is also naturally important. And then we might have a scene graph making sure that the, the views and the, the cool effect that we're going to do is, more, is complete, uh, correctly rendered and such. So, so these are suggestions on the internal implementations that we have. And then we also have these third-party packages, so third-party systems. Um, like for Win32, we might be using Glue and Curl, Curl for network tra uh, traffic, OpenSSL for secure communication back and forth with servers. We have Zlib, we have libpng to load images and such. But for uh, UWP, we might have different third-party packages or third-party dependencies. Like Angle, which I'm going to talk about later on, is one of the most important ones that we are, we are using. And we might... Uh, instead of using libpng, we might use the internal uh, APIs that UVP provides in our implementation. Uh, they might be even more performant, but it also might be easier just to make that. One thing that we also want to do when we write uh, the, the code for the engine and we write these uh, platform-specific implementations is we want to share as much code as possible between the platforms. We want to have as little unique platform code as possible. That is also why it's good for us to be a C++ implementation, because we can leverage a lot of the, th lot of the stuff that is common, but also a lot of the stuff that is uh, on, uh, running on other platforms as well. 
But this is not actually enough, having these components, because we need to have something that glues this together or keeps it together. And that is what we, we could call it the pipeline or the build pipeline or something like that. And this is also something we consider to be like a, a, a separate bucket itself. And the pipeline that we are using and uh, it's based on CMake. And if you were here this morning listening to the cross-platform talk for C++, they also talked about CMake. If you're not familiar with CMake, uh, you're going to have sort of a difficult time following along the code here, but I try to be as, as um, explainable as possible. But uh, CMake is actually a tool that uh, makes us not have stored project files and solutions in the uh, repository. So instead, CMake generates these project files for Xcode and for Visual Studio and for what have you actually to, and also helps us build this, uh, these systems or these applications uh, very efficiently. But CMake has a lot of parameters. You, if, if you want to really leverage CMake and to generate the Visual Studio solution, for instance, or the universal, universal Windows platform uh, version, we also have to parameterize it. We have to send them parameters and specifying which version of the SDK you want to use and such. So then we also have to have some sort of uh, configuration system on top of this. And we are using Python uh, uh, for this engine. Uh, you can also use, we, earlier we used something called Kral or K-R-A-L, which is available on GitHub uh, to configure it. And in the engine that I'm gonna show you, I actually am using PowerShell instead. So I'm using PowerShell for the configuration of the CMake pipeline. And then we're using naturally continuous integration deployment, using Git for version control, we're using Jenkins for automatic builds, uh, and also deploy to, to different internals and external uh, stores. So what I've done in preparation for this is actually I've created a sort of a, I, I can't show you, unfortunately, the, the proprietary code that King has. Uh, instead, I've created sort of a mimic, or sort of an, an influencer, fiction, fiction factor, or something like that, we can call it. And it's already available on bitly.build, slash build 2019 minus GES, if you want to follow along, and you'll get the links afterwards as well. So let me just switch over here, and I'll try to introduce you to this engine. So it's available uh, on github uh, github.com slash code rocks slash game engine sandbox, I'll call it. If you want to clone it, you're fine to do that, and you can build it as well. I tried to be as uh, thorough as possible explaining on what you need to set up and, and the preparations that you have. It builds with Visual Studio 2019, 2017. Um, you need CMake. Uh, you, you might, yeah, you need Python as well installed. I should probably write that as well. Okay, so what is this uh, engine then? Well, when you clone this repository, you will see it uh, structured in an, like a sort of a it's kind of simple, especially specifically if you saw the, uh, remember the images I've shown you with the game, the resources, the engine, the third party packages, and the pipeline. So we have the game, which in this turn is Snake. So I, when I try to learn new languages and such, I try to implement Snake kind of rapidly. So I've done Snake with this game engine sandbox as well. Um, and this includes resources, which is actually all the assets textures and uh, audio and sound and such that are common for the game, like apples and logos for splash screens and such. It also contains source code. So it has common code, which like the game state machine. Uh, it has source code like objects. It has source code line with scenes, which actually are the different views we're going uh, back and forth to uh, as game states. We also have platform-specific implementations. So you can already see how we've structured the code, is that we have a common directory which, with, with the code that is common to all the platforms that we're gonna build, and then we have platform-specific implementation in different uh, folders, like Win32, UWP, Linux, if we're gonna do that and such. Okay, and then we also have the dependencies, and the dependencies then is the engine, the third-party packages, and the pipeline, the pipeline in, in this way being the functions that I'm gonna call uh, from the, the, the PowerShell script. And also have a couple of platform specific f files like the manifest file that has to be uh, used in all the UWP applications, uh, the, the, a temporary key used for sign, sign, signing the application. I'm gonna talk to InjectPy as well later on. 
We have third-party packages, and this is actually just sub-modules of Angle and VC package for this purpose. Uh, so you can use them as well, and just use sub-module updates to get those down. And then we have the engine. And these are the packages that I've currently created for this purpose of this demonstration. So we have like, a, like an application, which is a bootstrapper. We have an application slash minus CX set. That is actually the old implementation, because I'm going to talk about migration to Win C++ WinRT. We have a file system package. We have a game loop package. We have systems, which are an another, another abstraction of packages. Uh, and then we have, um, well, utilities and update us. So we have a couple of packages. These are some of those that you can you know, possibly use them in, in this type of games and applications. So just for, I mentioned that different types of partitioning. So the application, well, let's, let's look at the file system package, for instance. That has this source code, and it's pretty much just the file system. But if you look at the systems package, it actually has several different systems. So depending on what your purpose is and how big your game engine is going to be, you can partition and use, uh, separate these different structures differently. And it's just, uh, I'm going to separate these out later on as well. But it's just to demonstration purpose and see that I can have these uh, as separate projects or packages. Uh, and it's also interesting because all of these packages that they're rendering, and they will be separate projects in Visual Studio. And building UWP with Visual Studio and using CMake actually has some, some flaws currently, meaning that if you have too many projects uh, in Visual Studio or generated by CMake, it takes a long, lot, lot of time to open the project. Also, it will take a lot of time every time you open the project because these projects aren't cached by Visual Studio as, it, as Win32 projects are. So that's something you have to uh, con consider as well when building these. Okay, and let's see, we'll go back to... We also have this pipeline here. So I have already generated the UWP version of this project because that takes a bit, uh, some time. But if I want to generate I want to generate or, oh, I guess this is the demo ghost. Uh, if I want to generate a new project, a new solution for uh, UWP, I can use this PowerShell script. I just say, pass the flag UWP. I say, I'm going to do a debug, and I do generate. Generate will set, uh, tell CMake to generate all the project files based on the CMake configuration that is available. And they, they, those are actually macros and scripts that tells which files should be included in the projects and stuff. You can look at that in the, in, in the source tree as well. I've already done that, so instead I'm, I'm gonna do update. That doesn't take too long, but now it has updated uh, the project files. I can go back to like Visual Studio 2019, may hit reload, and this is the project structure, the, the solution, solution structure that has generated for me. So in the bottom, I have the snake project, which is actually the client. It's also marked for uh, starting to debug. Uh, and then I have the engine in a folder with the application. Those packages are interesting for UWP. And I have a third-party package as well, and a third-party dependencies. And it's actually just Angle, which in turn actually has a couple of packages instead. So, beneath it. so I can run this. It will build it and just have a small splash screen very humble, and then a uh, small game of Snake, which I can play on, and I can pause it, and I can also die in the game if I, if I do it correctly, or wrong, actually. What I've also done for uh, demonstration purpose and also for make it kind of more interesting is if I'm using Visual Studio Code, I can just open this folder in Visual Studio Code. I'm just gonna close these now. And if everything works correctly, CMake Tools, I have installed the extension for Visual Studio Code, will just configure this project right away for Win32. So I've configured Visual Studio Code to be able to build this uh, solution or this, uh, this game engine and Snake game with CMake. So it detects which compiler is going to use and it does all the magic that CMake does. I'm going to close this. Now it has generated everything, everything works fine, so I can do uh, F7, which is actually building it. Now it builds the game as well. And when it's done, I can use 
Visual Studio Code to debug this game and game engine as well. Setting breakpoints and everything that you expect to do with Visual Studio Code. Here we go, and I just hit Control F5. And here we have it in Win the Win32 version instead. So it's, it's actually the same actually the same code running with these platform specific implementations. So this is the engine that is available right now. Uh, and as mentioned, you can absolutely download it or clone it if you want to. Uh, I'll give you that link once more if you want to uh, check it out. Um, I'm gonna continue working on it because it's actually really, really fun. One thing that we stumbled upon when we started doing this port to UWP was that Visual Studio has some specific requirements when it comes to content for, uh, that has to be packaged with uh, the application. And we have something called the resource pipeline, meaning that we also want to take all the assets that the artist creates and we want to make them available for the game in the format that the game can leverage as efficient as possible. We don't want to co do a lot of conversions during runtime or uh, well, we want to be as efficient as possible, meaning that we want to generate the resources uh, that is really mentioned for a, sp a specific platform. So after the project has been generated, we kick off this resource pipeline that produces all the resources that is available for like UWP or Win32 or iOS or something. The problem with that is that CMake has already produced the project file that we are gonna use to build the project. So how do we make sure that all of these content files then are being thrown into the, uh, the Apex that, that we're gonna deploy to, to the store and make it? Because that is something that has to be in the project file. All of the resources has to be referenced in the project file. This took us a while actually, and we, we evaluated different uh, options, but I'm gonna share the solution that we went for. And it's, it's kind of cumbersome to get it working properly, let's see. What we did was that, I'm gonna continue using Visual Studio Code here. If you're familiar with, let's try this. If you're familiar with CMake, you have this CMake list.txt for each project that you want to create. And here you can specify the, the dependencies on top, like the, these packages that this project is dependent upon, like the application, the game loop package or system. And then we can also say that if we are running on a Windows Store uh, configuration, if we were trying to build a UWP here, we want to set a, specific, a couple of uh, properties, like the name of the game, uh, the publisher ID, uh, like uh, the version number of the game and such, that we want to uh, inject into the manifest, actually. And these Placeholders can then be in the, let's see, in the pipeline. In the pipeline, they can be injected into the manifest, like the game package name, like the project name and such, by having CMake, oh, sorry, having CMake call a command called configure file. So this tells the, CMake structure that configure this file, the uh, AppMax manifest, and put it in this position instead. And then we can reference that, that file from our project. We can do the same with the resources, but in a different perspective. So instead, I'm gonna configure a Python script. So I have also in this folder a small Python script, which actually has two small XML snippets. And these snippets will also be configured by, um, uh, with, by CMake. So at first, I, I, I configure this Python script, I put it in a position where I can execute it, and then during the pipeline generation, if I'm configuring a UWP application, and I'm doing a generate, build, or update, which are the commands that I can do with this, I also make sure to call with Python this file. That will inject these XML snippets into the project file after it has been generated, putting it in a position to look like this. So I'm gonna open it in the end here. So it actually has injected, let's see. Oh, 
sorry. These snippets, and as you can see, they have been now configured with the snake game, which is the, the project. So what this snippet does actually, it's, it says that it has a target that runs before it starts to compile the application and calls the resources pipeline output or actually the custom resource, includes all the files in the resources that now have been produced and configured correctly, and then links them as deployment content in the project file. This is really efficient for us because the project file is really small, it's very rapidly injects this code again, uh, and it also helps us when we build the application naturally. So if you want to use that snippet, I also put that on a gist. So you can just copy that. It's like bitly slash VS assets. I'm trying to be creative of these names here, but that, that works. You can take a picture as well and you can type it up. What you have to remember is that the, the, there's two things that you need to uh, fix. And the first thing is you have to uh, figure out the correct paths for the include. Specifying you have to know where the project is being prop, uh, generated and where the resources are, and then you have to parse, uh, parse them but also you have to figure out yourself how to inject this logic into the generated project file. And you can use the code that I provided, uh, that, that Python, Python script. It's, it's a very naive implementation, but still it's something that is work, workable. Okay. So that was the first lesson regarding engines. Uh, and also uh, some more practical uh, experiences naturally. Then it comes to that more code than we think can actually be, we call it commonized or whatever. We can really leverage a lot of shared common code, not just by saying that we have common code that is available for all platforms, like for uh, iOS, Android, and Windows, but we also might say that for Win32 and UWP, there are absolutely more stuff that is common than between other platforms and the other platforms as the same. So, so you can actually structure these fi uh, folders that we have, like the UWP, Win32, Linux, OS X, Android. You can have like an MSFT folder, for instance, that is common code for both Win32 and UWP. And just makes, ma make sure that CMake in the scripts, you, you have this also in this, uh, this uh, small engine, uh, actually uh, pop, uh, populates or takes those codes as well, both when it generates Win32 and UWP. So it's, it's uh, highly efficient that, so we can very, really share code. But there are stuff that needs to be uh, impl implemented in a platform specific way, like file system I mentioned, uh, input handling, threading, keyboard handling, web views or web browsers, um, bootstrapping the application is di different between uh, the applications. So I want to show a couple of patterns in C++ that we've used for separating uh, platform specific code actually, or how we can use this. So once again, I'm going back to the Visual Studio code. Uh, yeah, I want to save that. I'm gonna do this. So the first one, I'm just gonna take my notes here. The first is the file system system in the engine. So if I look at the, there's a header here, uh, the file system is most interesting. It has this, uh, has two methods. It says get the resource dictionary, which actually is the, uh, the dictionary in the, or actually the directory it says. Yeah, the, the, the folder where the resources are packaged in the application. So, and, and it returns this as a W string or V string. And then we also have the load file. So these two methods are these, the naive implementation of the file system in this purpose. And in the implementation, I could do this in the CPP file. I can say like, okay, I'm gonna use um, this if defs or, oh, I actually wrote them down, what is it? Yeah, the preprocessor directives, yeah, that's right. Uh, to make sure that I actually use uh, sections in the code that is uh, uh, important for different implementations. And then, once again, I'm going back into CMake and saying, for this, uh, this one, it's in the pipeline. Type it now. In the, actually in this functions. So in this initialized pipeline, I actually specify that if you're doing um, Windows Store, then also make sure to define UWP. 
And if you're doing, if you're not doing Windows Store, but still in a uh, Microsoft compiler, then you do uh, define Win32 instead. And you can do Linux as well and such. Meaning that the implementation, all the code is actually in the same file, and we, if that's the sections that are interesting. We don't really like this. I, I think it's a bit too, it, it's, it's not really clear on what's, what's happening and such. It's, it, it's actually better in Visual Studio, but uh, it might also be this color, a color theme, but this is not the way that we really want to do it. So instead, we have a diff different setup. We could, for instance, use like this I file, which is not that interesting, but we have these uh, include folders and we have different headers for different platforms. So they have a common, common specification where it is open and close, and is open as well, but then they have this get method in which we re return the platform specific handle for the file when we open a file, for instance. So we can, or, uh, yeah, for the file. So UWP is using iStorage file, and the Win32 is using a file handle. And then the implementation for these are clean as well. So it's just a specific file for each specific platform. Uh, and th th this gives us a, a a better structure, I think, and also a better logic and seeing what, what um, would work for us. Win32 is similar. What might be inter interesting to know is that the structure that we are using for source files and headers, this include and source, all the headers that are posted are put in the include directory in all of these packages, they are also shared or actually, actually um, exposed externally for other packages. So if I refer to, if I reference a package like the file system, I can get a handle, I, I can, from the other packages, I can include the headers from the include directory. Make sense? But everything in the, com, uh, in the source directory is private to that package. So that doesn't get shared. That's, that's the spe package specific, specific, uh, implementation. Uh, there's also one other pattern we have used, and that is for, let's see, for, uh, I have to close them. In the engine, in the systems, we have this texture manager. We have a texture manager, which actually is a sort of a repository of textures. Um, it has a header, it has a common implementation in the common directory. And then we have something called, uh, well, the texture manager also has a unique pointer of a texture loader. And the texture loader is also common in the sense that it has a method called load texture, and it has a unique pointer of its implementation. So this is actually a forward declared implementation uh, class here, and then it's just declared there, and then we can, in the source file for each implementation, like for UWP, in the texture loader, we just implement or actually create an instance or a definition of the texture loader implementation. And then in the actual functions for the texture loader, we just make sure to forward these calls into the implementation. This is also kind of efficient for us because it makes us using, if you have a lot of structure, a lot of functions, a lot of logic, maybe also stuff that is not just uh, property bags being sent back and forth such as the file, but we also might have systems like to have to, to keep state. We can have an implementation that keeps that state, even though it's platform specific or something like that. Make sense? Cool. Oh, let's do this. Some heads up when it comes to writing platform specific code or C++, specifically then in C++. And what we stumbled upon, occasionally at least, I should say, and, and still do occasionally, I should say, is string handling in C++ is just a pain. Uh, and specifically, Windows is using UTF-16 for encoding, and other platforms are more familiar with UTF-8, I should say. Uh, so this is something that you very early in the project must fix and, and get a thorough um, infrastructure of handling these conversions back and forth between strings. Specifically, if you pass these strings between common code and platform-specific implementations. Then you have to decide which is the common uh, string handler we, we're gonna do. Usually, it's a uh, proprietary string class that's being used that, that captures this. Uh, but you, uh, for, this, for this purpose in this the engine, I'm just using SDV string for, for that. 
makes sense for the, the initial implementation of Windows 32 and, and UWP. Also, exception handling. If you are familiar with the, the Windows runtime, you know that Win, uh, Microsoft is uh, really using uh, exceptions from the uh, Windows runtime API to say that something has failed and such, not just by something has really, really crashed. It just doesn't work, like uh, open a file or something. They have started doing this try open and try get file and such, but uh, earlier it was just a lot of exceptions being thrown. So we had a lot of try and catch in our platform specific implementations, which was also something that the engine uh, team de didn't really uh, enjoy. So we tried to remove those as, pos as much as possible. So exception handling is something that you need to be familiar with, uh, with, specifically also when it comes to handling exceptions in asynchronous code, when you have callbacks coming back from uh, server calls or on background threads and such. If something happens on background threads, it's a pain, actually. So you have to really be thorough and really be uh, skilled in handling these uh, synchronization and marshalling back and forward and, and specifically handling errors there. When it comes to asynchronous and synchronous uh, patterns as well. Uh, there's also something that we have to handle in, uh, in using WWP, since there are a lot of async methods, like methods that we expect to take, well, it might take more than 50 milliseconds or something. They have this async implementation, uh, uh, what do you call it? Ah, method, method name. Uh, so we, but we also have to, if the overlaying, uh, over, the, the, the design is actually try, considering this to be a synchronous call, but we are doing it asynchronously. We have to handle this. We have to call this asynchronous method in a synchronous way. So we have to lock and such and do that with, with events and such. So there's different patterns we can use there. But what we also realized that we had to do really early is that we have to be really thorough in, in scheduling our callbacks that comes back if you are on a background thread or a UI thread that that Windows using for touch inputs and uh, like web browsers and events from web browsers handling on the UI thread. You have to be able to marshal that call or those calls into the render thread or the actually the actual game thread, the game loop in somehow. And the scheduler that is available can't really do that, specifically in the, in the way that we de um, developed this and the, the, the game loop that we have. So I'm gonna show you so, uh, our not a really good example of this, but it actually shows the code as well, at least how it works. So I'm gonna do this in, in Visual Studio. Uh, because it has been a lot better, I should say, with C++ WinRT with uh, doing uh, asynchronous calls and things. We used, uh, we used to have this parallel, well, parallel pattern library and task, li task library, task pattern library, um, with this create task, create a sync. We had this, like, a lot of call chains that are being uh, sent, but it's not much easier now with coroutines and that. So, uh, just to introduce you to the, the bootstrapper for Wind, uh, Uni, 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 UWP. We have a, this page, which is actually a XAML page or a page that, that's being leveraged that we in, uh, put into this uh, core window. And then we, when we, this page is being loaded, we kick off a uh, thread on the thread pool. We call this the render loop. Actually, it's a function called render loop. And we also make sure for deb debugging purposes, you can check this code out uh, in, um, in the engine as well, how we set the thread name so that in the dropdown list in Visual Studio, it will say game thread or UI thread instead of like NTDL or SH thread or something like that. It's much more clear when, when we're deb deb debugging, seeing well, how we're marshaling stuff back and forth. We initialize some stuff for uh, the OpenGL ES device, and then we go into this game loop, actually. And this is what uh, the magic. We have this uh, game loop that ticks, so every uh, frame, it just ticks. And we have a timer in the game loop that handles this that it's supposed to tick in a specific frame per second, like 60 is mo probably the most usual, but I actually configured this game to run on 15 frames per second, because otherwise it's just way too fast. So 15 works fine for Snake. Okay, so when we're using this while loop, the scheduler is having a difficult time to schedule back, uh, stuff back and forward into this game loop. Uh, or this while loop actually uh, by itself. So we have to be a bit more 
um, explicit. So we have created something called a dispatcher wrapper. So in the utilities, in the source for UWP, we have something called a dispatcher wrapper. And this takes the core dispatcher for the window, cap uh, captures that or caches that as a member. And then we can use like a run async that will uh, cause this uh, a, a lambda to be um, run on the UI thread. Or we can also say schedule this lambda or this function on the game thread or the game thread. And we have this concurrent queue that we pushes this lambda into. And then at the end of the game loop, we make sure that before we return or uh, create a new frame, we, dis we process all the scheduled functions that is uh, leveraged. Or actually that has been sub uh, submitted. So in the texture manager, oh sorry, the texture loader for UWP, I just show you, uh, even though it's not really required for this purpose, so it could, can look like this. I do a load texture. I have this uh, get pixel data from image async. That might come back on a background thread or a UI thread b based on where we have to run stuff in, on UWP. And then I can make sure that everything that happens here goes on the game thread just by scheduling this on the game thread. So it's a lambda that just that gets put in this concurrent queue and then it's getting run on the proper thread. This is important, for, for instance, when we load the textures, because when we create a texture and when we load the texture, or actually set the pixels for the texture, that those GL calls, the open GL calls, has to be made on the same thread. Otherwise, everything will just crash. Okay. Another lesson learned. Business values and reasons supersede technical ones. This is also something that we got to realize kind of early in the project, specifically when it comes to uh, OpenGL and the uh, Windows platform that we mentioned, I mentioned this earlier. Um, since the, the, we are using OpenGL or OpenGL ES for rendering and there's no native drivers for UWP, we were like really psyched about, hey, we're gonna, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create like a DirectX pipeline instead for the rendering engine and that will be a super cool project. Like there's not a lot of people that can create this type of uh, project. We're gonna learn a lot about that. But we learned really rapidly, thanks to the help from Microsoft actually, that there's a project called Angle, which Google has created. And it's something, it's called Almost Native Graphic Laser Engine which translates these OpenGL ES calls to the platform specific calls. And for our, our purpose, it's, it translates them into DirectX calls. And this is by instance used by Google Chromium and Mozilla Firefox on, running on Windows. So it's a really uh, thorough done project. It's, it's being continuously developed and they really want to have a high performance here. And what we realized kind of rapidly is like, there's no reasons whatsoever other than coolness to write this, uh, uh, rendering pipeline on DirectX to do our own pipeline. So instead we just used Angle, we pulled that in on Windows Phone and Windows, uh, Windows, Windows 10, and it just worked. It, it's amazingly cool technology. Actually, we were using the Microsoft fork uh, that Microsoft created uh, early in the project because that was actually targeting WinRT and uh, you know, uh, UWP as well. And there's some couple of things in the Microsoft fork that's still available, like the DDS loader is not available in the Google project. And they also have some actually experimental HoloLens support. We haven't really looked into that as well. Unfortunately, that has gone stale since like 2017 or something. We have done a small contribution back uh, with CMake and such for that, uh, but it's not something we would recommend. We are actually now using the native op uh, ang uh, Google version instead, um, which is really cool actually. And, and, and that works for us. If you want to check these out, these are the links as well I created for Angle. If you want to see how that actually works, just kind of rapidly, we can do that also in Visual Studio. So in the, let's open a small class in the game, a common game object called Apple. No, that's not. We're on Microsoft Conference, let's do Snake instead. <laughs> oh, that was really bad, that was poor, me. that was really bad. That, that, I, I have to do Snake, sorry. That was really bad, <laughs> that was low. Okay, 
we have a draw method here, uh, which actually, when we, when we want to draw this snake object, we have a sprite, we pass in a renderer. So let's look at the renderer, because this is everything that the draw method is actually make sure that we take into consideration the actual screen dimensions for the sprite in this process, because we can resize the windows back and forth. So in the systems, in the engine, in the systems, we have, in the common, we actually have the rendering, the sprite render. So this is a sprite render header that is included, uh, that yeah, we can leverage. Uh, Please make pay, pay attention here that this is actually platform common code. So this is actually code that is transition for overall platforms, even though we have like specific GL, GL definitions of uh, uh, unsigned integers and such. And if you look at the implementation, the common rendering, this is also common code. So everything here is actually uh, compiled for all the platforms that is available. And even though we are using these GL delete buffers, we are using the angle version by in the utilities project, making sure to include a specific wrapper for UWP, which in turn actually says that you're gonna use the headers from angle. And the utilities project, which is the wrapper for this, have a dependency on the angle packages or the DLLs or the static libraries that we are including. So that gives us a really nice and uh, very simplistic way of, of, of rendering stuff with 2D and 3D, and it just works. And it works with shaders, and uh, yeah, everything just worked pretty much. It was really, really cool. But sad that we couldn't do a DirectX pipeline. So these third-party dependencies then, so Angle was a pleasure to use. But we do have some third-party dependencies that actually is a pain to use as well. Uh, unfortunately, one of them is Facebook. So we want to use Facebook for authentication and to, to uh, actually make sure that we can play the game on different devices and still keep the, the state of the game where, where you're at in the game uh, synced between that. Uh, but there's no official Facebook SDK for UWP. So instead, we have to go back to Microsoft, and they have something called the Win SDK, Win SDK FBA, FB. So it's available on, on that bit.ly link. And that has like authentication, has dialogues uh, with the web views. It's using actually, actually the, the JavaScript API, uh, so it calls, and, and, but it renders in SAML views and such, and really, really nice, it really worked really good for us. So that was, that was good for us. Unfortunately, when we use this third-party open source SDK, uh, that is not in sync with what, my, what Facebook is doing on the back end. We have ha had a couple of uh, issues actually where Facebook does a major update without letting everyone know what's happening and they push out new versions of the SDK that the other game platforms can just use and we have to like either reverse engineer or wait for something that will be fixed in the SDK or maybe do contributions ourselves but it takes a lot of time and, and, and between those we, we, we might have users that can't authenticate or they lose, lose state and such, and that is a poor experience. What I've also done uh, is I created a C++ WinRT version because this Win SDK FBA is actually a C++ slash CX Windows runtime component, but there's a WinRT version as well. If you want to help me there, you just uh, ping me or just uh, check out the, the GitHub repo as well. As well. There's a, uh, a couple of other uh, dependencies as well, like we're using libpng, curl, OpenSSL, Zlib, I mentioned these angle. Uh, and what we've done is that we have used like VC package occasionally to maybe not include that in the, uh, in the project, uh, but we've pre-built some of the libraries that we wanna use for, for uh, our purposes, like uh, when we've used curl or OpenSSL, we use VC package to build that for UWP because then we don't have to configure that ourselves and, own that code, and it's really efficient. So VC package is also something that I would really recommend that if you're interested in C++ and cross-platform development, you should really look into that package manager, or library manager. That brings us to the migration we did to C++ slash WinRT. And, and this is something that has been really fun, actually, and really good, because Kenny Kerr and his team with, 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 with the C++ WinRT 
language projection for Windows Runtime, they are uh, super skilled and it's re really open with, with what they're doing and transparent in how they're, wh where they're heading as well. If you didn't look at this session yesterday, you should really try to look at it afterwards. It was a really good C++ WinRT 2.0 uh, session. So what this is actually is actually standardized C++ in headers that projects the Windows runtime that we can use from, from uh, any compiler actually and build these types of applications. It's also included in the Windows SDK, so it means that it's, it's, it's not something that we have to inject ourselves, it actually just works, so it's really nice. When we did this migration, we actually uh, also could leverage uh, coexistence, meaning that we didn't have to migrate all of the packages at once, or all the systems. We can take one package at a time. We can actually take one file at a time as well, because we can just m make sure that we use the correct namespaces, which actually mimics, uh, um, rep rep represents the namespaces that were available in the Windows runtime earlier as well, but now with the WinRT prefix instead. And that gives us a really efficient migration process, and that, that helps us a lot. You should be, however, uh, aware that if you're gonna do uh, migration and want to coexist, you can't do that if you have a lot of SAML files with SAML compiler or actually Windows Runtime, uh, Windows Runtime components, because that, has, uh, that, that leverages IDL files, and those are, that, that causes some issues. And specifically, IDL files causes issues with CMake, which is unfortunate. So we hope, I, I hope that uh, they will, they'll fix those um, moving forward because they are considered to be very specific and not used for this purpose like SAML descriptions of win, generate WinMD and such. So, I remember. Just a short hint on how we did the, uh, the migration. You can actually look at this as well yourself, but if you're looking at the application CXX, this should be, at least it was when I created it, it should be a direct CXX version of the application package which is using C++ WinRT, the modern version. And you can, for instance, say, that, okay, I want to check uh, what, what did you have to do in the, in the GL page, for instance, and then compare that to the WinRT version. Interesting. Here we go. And then I can see the differences I had to make. Like I included the WinRT namespace, for instance, in the, the WinRT version. Um, there's another syntax. We don't use these ref news to instantiate grids. It's actually just structs in, being created by runtime here. So we just uh, we don't use these arrow syntaxes either use points instead. Um, when we hook up a event handler, we don't use plus equals ref new, instead we just call the method and pass us in this structure which says which method we're gonna call on page loaded. You can look into this as well. And there's some, some differences that you might, must be aware of, like the platform object is actually a Windows Foundation ins I inspectable instead. Uh, there's no, these are, Fun. These are there are no hat syntaxes or I, I call, is it called circumflex I think something like that yeah uh, uh, instead we're passing these as const references but you can look into that uh, and if you want to run it if you want to use the CXX version the only thing that you actually have to do is I'm gonna close these tiles again is in the CMake lists for the engine. So in this, in this folder, I have this CMake list, which actually just adds subdirectories. If I just do this, minus CXX, and then hit update, or use the pipeline and update the UWP version again, I'm using the old version, and that, that should use the CXX version. And then you can look uh, how that works in practice. Okay. Let's shift some focus now and talk about native features, because we actually wanted to use uh, native features of Windows to create native experiences. We, when we tried to implement stuff that was only available on Windows, we noticed that users really liked it. We saw uh, increased engagement, increased usage, and increased usage instead, and that was a good thing. But not only when it comes to features, it also comes to us understanding the strengths and weaknesses of the different 
fe uh, features of the platform and the ecosystem, such as Windows Store. So Windows Store is the, the, naturally the, the deployer of our, our games, make sure that pe people can find them and such. So we have to spend a lot of time getting a good PDP excellence, or the product description page has to be really good. We use videos, we register uh, hero banners and keywords when you search for games. Uh, th this is really important. Also, what you should be aware, when you, try to when you want to create a new game, you should not, uh, you be aware of that people like to reserve product names even though they are trademarked. Uh, meaning that if you try to reserve, um, if you try to reserve your, your game that you have the trademark for, you might have to talk to Microsoft and get help, help, have them help you unlock it uh, because it's, it's yours to keep and such. But, but it's something that will take a, a couple of weeks. Uh, and if you have a launch coming up and you, you have, you're late in your submission, then you're, you, you might be up for a treat. So make sure that you have that set up. Also, what you might be aware of, and if you don't know it, it's kind of interesting, like the purchases, like in-app purchases, you can't test those if you submit or the application as a private uh, available application. You have to be publicly available to do purchases yourself. Uh, but you can hide the application from search, meaning that users can only find the application if you have a direct link. Yeah, I, it's, it's four, I have four minutes left. Okay, so th that is something that might, you should be aware of. Also, there's something called the Store Services REST API. This is actually a REST API that you can use from Python or Java, and there's PowerShell uh, commandlets as well that you can use. Uh, unfortunately, though, it, it requires Azure Active Directory, which is a bit cumbersome if you are not using that today. You have to get that set up. Uh, also, you might also be aware that some of the properties in the submissions, like for an IAP in a purchase, they are not exposed to these REST APIs. So this means that the process are occasionally broken, meaning that if you, if you want to create a submission on an IAP, the first time you create the IAP, you have to do that through the UI but then you can update the IAP with the store services on the REST APIs. You can do batch scripts and such that helps you uh, automate new, uh, new uh, submissions, change prices, create campaigns, icons, descriptions and such. Also be aware that uh, you sh you, when you do an update, a submission on, on an IAP or uh, anything, you either go for the UI or you go for the script. You can't like create an, a submission with the script and then play around with it in the UI. These are actually separate processes. So you have to choose uh, any of these, uh, one of them. Also, be aware that the API is capped, meaning uh, you can't do a lot of calls at the same time, specifically posts and updates. Uh, that, that It takes some time. So you have to implement retry logic or sleep logic or something like that, uh, making sure that you don't spam the API too much. Another lesson, this is also one of my favorite quotes, with great power comes great responsibility, because you can use some really cool stuff on the Windows platform, but you should also be not too aggressive with this. One thing is the tile updates, naturally. If, you have, if, your, if your customers are pinning your application to the start menu, uh, you can use tile updates, making sure that they are uh, updated with content and updated with like cool graphics and such, uh, making users aware of that uh, there are some uh, new th new stuff available in the game or the application. And these can be pushed from push notifications, no secret there. They can also be pulled from the tile manifest, or the, actually the application manifest. So you have a schedule where you can say that fetch a new version of the tile uh, schema from this URL, and they will uh, fetch them down. And you can change that schema then in the cloud and then you can change with graphics and such, you can make that happen without having to do any, any binary updates on the application, which is kind of nice. You can also schedule naturally updates through code. And what's really co cool here is that you can use something called the update task. This is like a hidden gem on the UWP. This means that there's some background task available called windows.update task that you can uh, subscribe to, actually create and implement, which will uh, run its logic even though the client have never run the application when it gets updated from store. So when the application gets automatically updated from store, this logic will be run. And you can schedule stuff there. You can schedule tile, up, tile updates, tile notifications. You can do toast notifications. You can do really cool stuff, but please don't be too aggressive. 
uh, instead try to be humble and, and do. But it's, I, still, it's important because if, if, you, if your application has been updated like three or four times and, and the customer has still not played the game or whatever, make sure you do a, like a hint. Hey, want to play the game? Uh, let's do this and uh, let's do a tile update or then a small toast notification saying, here's a couple of gold bars or something like that. There's also something called the Store Services SDK, uh, which is actually a uh, uh, Microsoft SDK with some uh, features that you can use uh, for doing notifications, push notifications from store instead of your own infrastructure. This is also interesting because then you can use metadata for the users from store, like uh, specific for uh, users in the store as their profile is on, on Windows instead of the metadata that you have as a client or your, your infrastructure. You can do kind of cool stuff there as well. Be careful though. You can also use this store services SDK for running experiments for A-B testing, which is really hot on the game, de uh, game development area. Uh, and you can do this for logging if you don't have that infrastructure set up as well. So my last slide or last lesson here is actually, I've, I've shown you a couple of uh, high, high level lessons learned. I've also shown you a couple of detailed things in C++ and UWP, but keep it simple because less is usually more. Our team that has done this port of the engine to do UWP and released all of these games, we have three people. We have one project manager and, and uh, three developers actually. And we do uh, handle all of these games uh, for, for the Windows platform. We don't want to be too many people because we find that we are better aligned when we're just uh, not that many. Uh, we are kind of, we don't, we don't want to be bothered with too many meetings and such as well. So we are really efficient when it comes to working. We, so we try to keep our, the, the efforts that we do as simple as possible and also have like a fun experience of doing that. That's also why we don't want to overdo and over architect stuff. We want to make really fun and cool games because that is what we, we're into our doing here. So these are some of the lessons then uh, that we've uh, learned for the last couple of years. Uh, I hope that you have uh, had a good time listening to this and there's at least some content that is uh, vital to you as well. And please uh, share your feedback. And also, if you want to tweet me afterwards, this is my Twitter alias. Uh, if you want to have any ask any questions, I'll be sticking around somewhere here. I just have to get off the stage, I guess, because there's another, another speaker coming. Uh, with that, have a good day. Thank you.